Well, good morning and welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to welcome you here to Kingwood Christian Church. You know what? I woke up this morning at 4.45. I was so excited to come and visit with you guys and see you. Okay, I didn't do that on purpose. But it did happen. I did wake up at 4.45. Hopefully you had your extra hour of sleep this morning and enjoyed that a little bit more than Amber and I did because we did not set our clocks back that hour. Well, we are glad that you are here. As you look around the sanctuary in this very unique time that we navigate here together, you'll see that there are some different uh, accommodations that have been made uh, to make sure that you are safe, to make sure that our musicians are safe. You'll see different podiums. You'll see different mics set in different places. You'll see, of course, the plexiglass to make sure that we're doing our very, very best to make this as comfortable and safe of an environment as possible. You'll also see this, this, uh, this camera up here and some other efforts that we're making because more than half, in fact, probably 60, 70, 80 percent of our congregation is going to join us virtually. And so we're thinking about them and we're trying to make this experience just as meaningful to them as it is for you. But I do want to remind you as we enter into worship this morning that though there are things that have changed, that this is still your church home, that this is still your sanctuary. And so as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, I invite you to take just a moment and reclaim this space as your meeting place with God and your church family. Let's all enjoy the prelude together. Will you join me now in reading responsively our call to worship from your worship guide? For all who give you a face, Lord Jesus, by spreading your love in the world, we praise you. For all who give you hands by doing their best towards their sisters and brothers, we praise you. For all who give you a mouth, Lord Jesus, by defending the weak and the oppressed, we praise you for all who give you eyes by seeing your image in the heart of every man and woman we praise you for all who give you a heart Lord Jesus by loving the poor as well as the rich the weak as well as the strong we praise you for all who reveal you simply by what they are Lord Jesus because they reflect your beauty in their lives, we praise you. You who are the God of a thousand faces, yet whom nothing can reveal completely, we praise you. Let your Son become flesh in us, so that we may be for all our brothers and sisters the revelation of your love. Will you join us now in singing our first hymn, All People That on Earth Do Dwell.
pray with me? Living God, we come to you with gratitude for life and for this day. We long to sit in your presence and hear your words spoken over us once again. We commit these moments to memory, to remembering you, your goodness, your love, your deeds among us. The psalmist writes, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. On this day, we also come to this place joining with people of faith all over the world and we remember the lives of loved ones lost in this past year. And so we pause and we say their name. Names written on our hearts. We love them and commit them to your gentle care. William E. Hartman. Paige Kodalek Jones. Jerry Nelson. Ada Brown. Margie Tankersley. Phyllis Spencer. Dorothy Felix Watson. Charlotte Mundy, Jonathan Ferris, Gail Martin, Wayne Putz, Yvonne Morgan, Evelyn Mary Moffat. Darcy Garber, Ann Pearl, Randall Hitchcock, Harold Williams, Krishna Dutta, Joanne Callan. William Leach, Shirley Romano, Dennis Kistner, and Dale Morris. Living God, we give you thanks for the beauty of the relationship that we shared with all of these loved ones. We thank you for your incredible love for them. And we entrust them into your beautiful and loving arms. May they always live on in our lives and in our memories until we meet again. God, we love you. We pray these things in the name of Christ. And now let us all gather together and sing the, sing the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples.
Okay. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Okay, guys, I have a question for you today. Has anyone ever spilled anything on their clothes? You have? Tell us. Um, I spilled chocolate milk on my clothes. That's true. You spilled chocolate milk on your clothes this week, didn't you? It was a brand new shirt, but it came off in the mail. So what happens when you spill something on your clothes? Um, there's a... There's a big stain. Yeah. There's a big stain. What do you need to do immediately after you spill on your clothes? Put it in the washer? Yes, you have to take them off and put them in the washer, right? And then what do you do? Get it dry. Okay, but while it's washing, so let's think it through. You spilled on your clothes. We take them off to put in the washer, and what do you do right then? Turn it on and put in soap. Okay, right. <laughs> but you, your body, what do you put on your body? Thank you. New clothes. Okay, so when our clothes get dirty, we have to change into nice new clean clothes, right? Because you can't wear like a shirt with chocolate milk stain all day long. Okay, so because we are all children of God, which we've been talking about for the last several weeks, we know that God wants us to act with love and kindness towards everyone. Those are the good actions that God wants from us. Can anyone think of an example of a good action we can do to help us be loving towards other people? Um, it could be um, walking your dog. Okay, walking the dog. That's absolutely loving to the dog and to mama and papa, so we don't have to do it. What else? What's a good action you can do to be loving towards people? Clean up the house. Say it louder. Clean up the house. Yes, clean up the house. I'm going to make a list. What about you? What's a good action we can do to be loving towards other people? What if, like, your mom asks you to do something and you don't really want to do it? How could you be loving towards your mother? By doing it. Yes, and what kind of attitude would you have while you do it? A good one. Oh, a loving, good, nice attitude with a smiling face. Do you have something else? Um, it could be, like, so about when you get to see your grandma again. And how would you act loving towards grandma when you see her? Happy. But how would you show that? With love. How would you show your love? What would you do? Um, give her flowers. Give her flowers. Okay, you could bring someone flowers. You could bring someone chocolate. You could bring someone chocolates. That's true. So when we act with love, it's like putting on new clean clothes. So our not very good choices, our bad actions, or our not loving actions are like our dirty clothes. And when we take them off and put on clean clothes, that's like acting with love. Does that make sense? So we want to make sure that we're always putting on nice, clean clothes with our good, loving actions towards everyone. Okay, let's bow our heads and say a little prayer. Dear God, thank you for making us all your children. Help us to act with love towards everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, friends, again. It is so good. I can't express to you how good it is to see your faces and to welcome you again into this place of sanctuary. I can't help but ask, how are you doing? I know that I can only see your eyes. Anytime that I ask my son that question, he gives me the same answer. I'm bored. 
It's the typical, it's the typical teenage answer, I'm bored, Dad. Well, 2020 has been anything but boring. As we continue on navigating just step by step, challenge by challenge through this pandemic time, it seems like there's just as soon as we kind of overcome one hurdle, then there's another hurdle. And then, of course, there's an election, I'm told, that's coming up pretty soon here as well. Over this past uh, week or two, I've been employing a, a meditation from Psalm 46, verse 10. It simply says, be still and know that I am God. It has this beautiful cadence to it. Say it with me. Be still and know that I am God. One more time. Be still and know that I am God. It's a simple reminder. First, to just take a breath. And also to remember. Remember that God is. And that God is good. Let me add something to it as well. That this is a safe place. That you are among friends. That this is a house of love that you have entered into. That love and acceptance is yours here in this place. Well this morning we continue on in a teaching series entitled, Come Unity. Hello, folks. These are divisive times. I mean, as we, as we all know, there are so many different issues that are vying to divide us, to, to, to filter us one way or the other. These are divisive times, and yet God calls us to unity. You see it throughout the scriptures. We're called again and again to to protect our unity, to defend our unity, to make sure that we're working and laboring for our unity. Not uniformity, but unity amidst diversity. One of the great messages that we've celebrated in these past few uh, few weeks is that one of Jesus' primary objectives was to come and to break down the barriers that divide us. It was his objective to those walls, to break down those walls that separate people, that separate families, and to unite them in one great new humanity. One big happy family. Right? Maybe? Got a little ways to go? Well, he never said that this was going to be easy work. Jesus never promised that that we would be able to accomplish this in short order. We must be willing to work for it, to endure, to stick it out, even when it's hard. Do you know that 25% of churchgoers, they've switched churches during the pandemic? 25%, one in four has chosen to go to a different church during this pandemic time. Do you know that 35% of churchgoers haven't gone to church and haven't even attended a virtual service? I think that we're kind of almost stacking the deck against unity when we don't stick it out, when we don't lean in, when we don't endure for the sake of unity. And so I invite you, Uh, to join me in Ephesians chapter 4. This is the the target of this series, that we would be able to remain committed and unified in walking into the future together. So this is Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Ephesus is actually a very kind of uh, diverse city. It was on a seaport, and so there's people from all over the the known world at that time that lived in Ephesus. And so Paul is writing this letter. And one of the messages that he, that he elevates is, is, is seen in verse 25. He says, we are all a part of one another. We are all a part of one another. As much as we try to convince ourselves that we're all independent, that we're all individuals, that we can live our life and have no effect on others, the scripture tells us completely different. That we are all completely connected. 
We are interdependent on each other. That in fact, my peace depends on your peace. My well-being depends on your well-being. That it's impossible for my well-being to continue unless my neighbor is experiencing well-being. If they are suffering, it is going to affect me. If I'm suffering, it's going to affect them. So we must learn how to live as a family. How to live together. And this is the focus of our text today. I invite you to join me. We'll have it up on the screen there. Ephesians chapter 4, starting off there in verse 29. So let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but rather only words of grace. In this election cycle, the verbiage, the words that are, that are being shot as arrows back and forth between groups, they are especially divisive. They are especially aggressive. And so it makes it really, really hard for people that might have different perspectives, that might be on different sides of the aisle, to have conversations. Have you experienced this? I was at the grocery store the other day, and there was a gentleman that was standing next to me, and he had a little sticker on his, on his shirt that said, I just voted, and so I just, I just said, good job, man. I mean, I just kind of encouraged, I'm so glad that you went to vote. He started yelling at me. He was just angry. It wasn't that I, he was angry about my encouraging him to vote. He was just angry. And I think people are angry. Right now, and so Paul's words are so much so pertinent to this moment that we would consider our words. That before anything comes out of our mouth, that we would filter them through this, this filter of are they constructive? Are they, are they healing words? Paul gives us this, this standard that they must meet. Are they words full of grace? Do they project favor? This grace means unmerited favor. Do they project favor upon that person, whether they are a person in agreement with you or disagreement? You know, over these past months, Margaret and I have prayerfully considered our words. We have prayed diligently about what are the words that we can share with our church family Oftentimes from this very spot with none of you out here, we're staring into a, into a camera lens and we're trying to, to connect, trying to encourage you, try to find good words, wise words, constructive words that are consistent and represent the heart of Jesus well. I ask for your continued prayers for that. These are hard times to find words. Let's go on to the second part of this passage in verse 30 and through 32. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit with which you were marked. So that term for Holy Spirit, it's the term pneuma. That's the Greek term for spirit. It can also be translated as, um, as breath. So spirit of God or breath of God. And so this spirit, she, she, she has some work that she wants to do. She marks us, but then wants to lead us on a journey that transforms us. She wants to actually lead us to take on some things and to let go of some things. Lisa mentioned this in her children's moment. Uh, Paul uses the metaphor of taking off clothes and, and putting on some different clothes. Uh, 
I, I don't know about any of you, but uh, if Amber were here, my wife were here, then she would definitely attest that I have some clothes that, that I wore in college that I still wear today. They are some of my, some of them are my favorite clothes. Um, and, and, and she doesn't necessarily agree with me that I should hang on to those clothes. Uh, in fact, there are times when it seems like those clothes, they disappear. And there isn't, it's like a mystery as to where they went. But sometimes it's necessary to let go of things from our past. Sometimes those things are holding us back in different ways. Richard Rohr actually makes this statement. He says, all great spirituality is about letting go of what you do not need and who you are not. He says, there are some attachments, some attachments that hold us in place kind of like some old clothes that, that feel comfortable, they fit, they feel right to us, but they're holding us in place. They're calling us back to a time before, and we've moved on, or maybe we need to move on. It's almost like sometimes these, these attachments, they suffocate our breath. If that were the spirit, they suffocate, suffocate the breath of God that wants to enter into us anew and change us and send us in new directions in life. And so I want to introduce you this morning to, to the practice, the spiritual practice of detachment. Essentially, this spiritual practice is about, it's about letting go of the lesser things and, and taking hold of some greater things. You can probably even identify some of those things that are in your life right now that are attachments, that you probably, if you were honest, you need to let go of some of those attachments and make room for some new attachments. You know, the early church, leadership and, and the saints, they, they all practiced this spiritual practice of detachment. The reason why they did this is because they saw it in the life of Jesus. Though Jesus was the incarnate, Jesus was the Son of God, he set aside his own power and position, and what did he do? He set that aside, he let that go, and he instead took on the role of humility, took on, took on the role of a servant, and ultimately gave his life away to show us a different definition of what power was and what position was to reveal the heart of God. Now this is this mystery, this Pascal mystery of the Christian faith, that, that it is by letting go, it is by dying that we will live. It's by letting go of some of those attachments that hold us in place that we might welcome or embrace new life, the new stuff that God wants to do in our lives. Jesus said it best. He said anyone who wants to save their life will lose it. But anyone who would lose their life for my sake will find it. And so I ask you, what attachments are holding you back? What behaviors, what actions, what mindsets from your past still have effect on you. They're kind of like the old t-shirts that I can't throw away. They, they, they feel real comfortable, but they aren't good for where I'm headed in life. What are the attachments that are holding you in place? Do you know that those same saints, those same early church leaders, they had this, this beautiful mantra that they used to let go of their attachments? It was a simple refrain. All it says is this. It says, For the love of Jesus, I let go. Call to mind with me one of your attachments. We all have them. And then say with me, For the love of Jesus, I let go. For the love of Jesus, 
I let go. One more time. For the love of Jesus, I let go. Let's finish our passage. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The Spirit, she, comes and blows new wind into our life, but has a purpose that we would learn how to love like God loves. Three times, the same word for love, the Greek is beautiful, it has four different terms for love. And they use the same term, again, three different times. Paul makes sure that they, they can't miss it. It's this agape love. It's this love that God offers to us. It's this love that's not circumstantial. It's not fickle. It's this love that's loyal like family. Jesus says, love your neighbor just as I have loved you, so you love your neighbor. Love like that. Now that love unifies us. This love calls us to look at our neighbor as, extent, as an extension of ourself, to look at our neighbor and to say, my peace is directly connected to your peace. Your well-being is directly connected to my well-being. Like a family member. Had a wonderful mentor of mine that taught me a simple statement. He would recite this to his congregation uh, almost every week. And it, and it grows from this first line, a beloved child of God. That first line in, in, in chapter 5, verse 1, beloved child of God. This is the statement that he would, he would say. He would say, you are a beloved child of God. You're loved completely. You always have been and you always will be. I want you to say that, first of all. Allow it to sink in for you. I want you to say, I. I want you to say this with me and I want you to say, I, instead of you. Will you say it with me? I am a beloved child of God. I am loved completely. I always have been and I always will be. Doesn't that, doesn't that just feel right? Doesn't it represent the kind of love that God just lavishes over us? Now, only when we've allowed that to sink in a little bit, can we look at our neighbor, the one that thinks like us, the one that might be a lot like us, or the one that's very different from us, and we might be able to extend that same statement and say, you are a beloved child of God. You're loved completely. You always have been, and you always will be. I think that this just simple statement is the beginning point for how we remain unified during this time. It's only when we understand and receive this love from God that God has for each and every one of us that you can give that same love away. And this, as the passage ends, our passage for today, this is how we become this beautiful aroma of God, the breath, the wind of God, honoring God in our world in these challenging times. And so I invite you as we have, throughout this sermon series, we have ended every sermon with this beautiful prayer of St. Uh, Teresa of Avila. And so you've, you've heard these words um, I invite you, you can listen to them once, but I want you to join me as you are able. Christ, 
There's nobody now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he sees. Yours are the feet with which he walks. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Are the hands. Sing with me. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he sees. Yours are the feet with which He walks. Yours are the hands with which He blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Last time. Will you recite with me our one confession of faith? We confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and proclaim him Lord and Savior of the world. When we come to the table, we're looking at the place that empowers the wardrobe change that Lisa and Chad invited us to consider we need power to take off the old clothes of malice and hatred before we are going to be willing to do that and take on that new spirit of kindness and love. My friends, that's why we gather here at this table so that we know that this is the place where that first transition happened. For Jesus was despised and rejected. They said terrible things to him, though he was the essence of love in this world. But he was willing to put aside those feelings of retribution and malice that he must have experienced as a human and said, I'm going to return love for the evil that has been shown to me. May we, as we take this bread and drink of this cup, may we be this election week the spirit of love in our communities. It was on the night before Jesus went to be with the Father that he took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body, it is given for you. Whenever you take of it, remember me. And likewise, he took the cup and blessed it, and he said, this is the new wardrobe. This is the kindness. This is the promise. Every time you drink it, you're showing the love that I have given. You are imitators of God. We invite you now to Take off the first level of cellophane, or if in your homes you're gathering with the bread. As you take of this bread and break it and eat, think of what you need to detach from, what you need to let go of for the love of Jesus. 
and then as you take the next level off, decide what new act of kindness you can show in the world so that we may truly be the eyes, the mouth, the feet, the very essence of love in our world. As you're partaking, I'll speak our prayer aloud. Kind Father, we come to this table in awe of what you have accomplished on earth to give us the possibility of setting aside our hatred, our divisions, our malice, and taking on the spirit of kindness. It is a never-ending job both within our own hearts and then as we spread the love to neighbors, to community, as we pray for our nation and for our world. We come to you in deepest gratitude for this great gift. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're so grateful today to have this orchestral ensemble from Kingwood Park. We're grateful that you've been here to bless us with your gifts and now we will enter into a spirit of meditation as they play for us again. Good morning. As we conclude our service today, I want to give thanks for all the many offerings that have come from this community to this church, for the offerings of time and talent, perseverance, and what a joy it is to see everybody here today. I found this prayer. I thought it spoke to us in this time of the pandemic and time of the elections and the time of loss of so many loved ones. So I'd like to share that with you this morning. Will you pray with me? Jesus, you are the good shepherd. We confess our fears and ask for your protection. Jesus, you are the bread of life. We place before you our need of protection and ask for your blessing. Lord, you are the true vine. We confess our failings and ask for your goodness to grow in our lives. Jesus, you are the light of the world. We ask for your hope to burn in the darkness. God, you are the resurrection and the life. We ask for your grace to lift our eyes to eternity. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Draw us near to you and to one another. Amen.
As always, please do check the weekly emails and the little blurb in the worship guide today for all of the events and information on the events in life of the church. I have a couple with which to talk to you about today. First off, the turkey drive continues. Donations of $10 are needed to help Mission Northeast provide Thanksgiving meals to needy families. <coughs> yeah? I'm personally not really feeling a lot of, uh, <clears throat> of fear of needing to dress up like the turkey this year. And I'm not feeling like you guys really want it that bad because it's going to take 300 turkeys. And I know kind of where the numbers are, and I'm thinking that we've got a long way to go. We've got this Sunday, and then we've got through next Sunday, and then it's Thanksgiving. And so I'm just thinking, like, if you want me to dress up like a turkey, I'm talking head to toe like a turkey. I've even got a dance prepared. <laughs> then you're going to have to show me the money. <laughs> so just a little bit of encouragement. That uh, We've got just one more week, guys. One more week. And then... It's turkey time. Okay. Okay? Well, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a lot of gobble-gobble coming from our pastor. <laughs> so I believe in you. Bring in that money. Make those donations. We have the table set up out here as well as a link on the website for you to give. Please, let's see Chad in a turkey costume. That's what we need this year. See that. As if it's not scary enough. Chad in a turkey costume. <laughs> Next up, First Fruit starts today and goes through November 7th. And next Sunday, November 8th, we have our congregational meeting following the service. So please do make plans to attend that. And then finally, thank you to those of you who donated to the Ham Holiday Food Drive. Now for our final hymn, uh, since we are back inside, uh, feel free to hum, to speak the words, sing softly if you'd like. But we're going to stay seated. We're going to sing the hymn out. And join us as we sing our final hymn, 408, Come Share the Lord, All Verses. And imitate God, living in love. Put your hope in God's word, and let your own words be truthful and constructive. May sin rouse your anger, but never let anger cause you to sin. Don't allow any room for evil. And may God always hear your voice. May Christ Jesus raise you to new life, and may the Holy Spirit nourish you for the life of love. We go in peace to serve the Lord. Have a wonderful week, and we will see you next Sunday.